Welcome. In this session, we're going to discuss health disparities. By the end of this session, you should be able to define equity, inequality, and health disparities, and discuss the main factors that influence health disparities in low and middle income countries. Let's start by looking at some of the key terms that relate to health disparities, but I'm going to ask the students before we uh, reveal the more formal definitions. Emily, what does the term equity mean to you? Um, to me, equity would mean um, people having uh, equal opportunities and equal treatment. Okay. It's an, a normative term. It, uh, it, it relates to some notion of fairness, right? And um, Rachel, when we talk about inequality, especially when we think of health, what does that notion mean to you? To me, it means an uneven distribution of resources where some people have more than they need and some people have much less than they need. Okay. Uh, and some might also say, in addition, it has to do with unequal outcomes. That, um, that occur for, for different people, sometimes because of unequal access to, inequal access to resources. And Elizabeth, when we talk about health disparities, what does that term mean to you? Um, it means a difference in health outcomes, sometimes uh, those disparities being completely unnecessary in terms of if everybody had equal access, if everyone had equal opportunity, they should be able to achieve the same outcomes controlling for genetic factors. Okay. I mean, in fact, um, I think you've picked up the notion that most people think of when they talk about health disparities, which is the notion that these differences uh, relate to unfair advantages uh, that, or disadvantages that some people have compared to others. So let's look for a second at the more formal definitions of equity and equality and health disparities. So equity, as we talked about, connotes some notions of fairness. Equity includes fairness concerns about achievement of health and the capability to achieve good health, not just to distribution of health care. Inequality concerns differences in health status or in the distribution of health determinants between different population groups. Disparities, in some respects, brings all of these terms together, since it can be thought of as differences in health status that relate to social disadvantage. Now, in principle, these are different. And you could all ask me, but when you do your reading in global health, don't they all get mixed up? And I think, in fact, they, they do. And I'm going to refer largely, as we go through this discussion, to health disparities, which in some respects is the broadest of the categories. We're going to focus is on differences in health outcomes, but especially differences in health outcomes that have to do to uh, a lack of fairness in the way that different health systems treat different members of the population. Now, everyone should understand that questions about health disparities are absolutely central to the study of public health and the study of global health. And, and I hope when you think about uh, global health, you'll look at every issue that you uh, are examining in global health through what I would call a kind of equity lens. You know, put on a set of eyeglasses that help you to think about uh, the health status of different people, their access to health services, the coverage of health services, the, the extent to which they're protected from the financial risks because of health costs, the extent to which the approach to financing the system is fair, and the distribution of health benefits. Clearly, one of your goals as policymakers and our goals as just citizens is to see a population with the fewest number of health disparities that could possibly exist. Now, let's look to get a better feel for these at some of the factors that most relate to the appearance of health disparities. So, uh, Shailen, when you think about health disparities, what are the, some of the factors you think that help to create them or are linked with them? I think that there's a lot of factors, but I predominantly think of access to resources, which would be monetary. I also think about um, location um, and whether people have access because they are closer to services that may be urban as opposed to people in rural areas. I also think about um, 
you know, if there are certain groups of people that may be more marginalized or ostracized from society and how that affects um, their access to okay. health care. So Shailen says some of the factors that are related to health disparities have to do with socioeconomic status. What kind of money do people have, uh, whether they're urban or they're rural, and whether or not they're members of a majority or a minority community, a marginalized community, or one that has more, more social, political, or economic power. And Elizabeth, what are some of the factors that you think of when you're thinking about health disparities? When I think about health disparities, I think mostly about the idea of discrimination, that there are certain groups uh, that are treated a certain way because of held preconceptions. And what kind of groups might those be? Generally speaking, mm -hmm. in a kind of universal way, who are people who are often the subject of discrimination? I think of indigenous populations, I think of ethnic minorities. Uh, in certain places, uh, people with a certain religion might be discriminated against. People that are poor might be discriminated against. Uh, I know in our own healthcare system, sometimes people of certain races are discriminated against. Okay, and I think uh, these answers have been thoughtful. And so let's look for a second at a graphic that actually outlines what we might call, um, in a simplified way, some of the key factors associated with health disparities. You know, in a crude manner for which I beg your forgiveness, in a way what we can think of is you're, that we're likely to find health disparities along any dimension uh, around which people in different societies discriminate. And here what we can see is some of the factors that are most associated with health disparities have to do with uh, social and economic status. People are better off or less well off. Um, what is their health status and are they disabled? I think everyone understands that if you have a patient with leprosy who comes and they're disfigured by their disease, it's very possible that a healthcare worker who's not used to working with them and people in the society who aren't used to dealing with them may discriminate against them and may not be comfortable. We saw lots of this, for example, and we still see it with HIV and AIDS. Ethnicity is a common basis for health disparities. And of course, we know that many of these go together because people who are indigenous, people who may be from certain ethnic groups, may also tend to be of lower income and lower educational status than others. Gender is often a basis for health disparities. In man many countries, uh, there are preferences for males. In many countries, men have more economic, political, and social power. And in, in, and in many countries as well, a woman may suffer from a range of health disparities. Religion is often a force that divides rather than unifies, and we'll see this in a number of societies where perhaps the majority religious group enjoys better health, better access, better coverage, linked partly to higher incomes, more education, etc., than groups who may be from a minority um, uh, religion. Location usually plays itself out in terms of urban and rural, though you also might see it playing out, of course, in lowland highland, which is just another manifestation of the same thing. And occupation makes a lot of difference. Um, if someone, uh, people who are known to be, uh, shall I say, professors uh, or engineers with a certain title after their name uh, or, uh, ph or physicians, are people or, or teachers or um, uh, people in the clergy may have a certain amount of respect that's inherent with their positions in some societies and may actually get treated better than, for example, a poor woman in North India who's employed by breaking bricks for road building and who is regarded by many other people in society as someone of very low occupational, very low educational, very low social status and who might therefore uh, find herself suffering health disparities partly linked to her occupational status. And here by social capital, we mean, in a way, the relationships that people have with others in society and the support that they get from those relationships. And we know that people's health actually has something to do with that. And uh, the more one has social capital, uh, the more likely it is one is likely to be healthy. And the more marginalized you are, the more your life of living without much contact or support from others, the more likely it is that you might suffer from health disparities, again, that go along with a number of these, um, these matters.
So let's look for a second at some of these points now in, in greater detail. And uh, these slides should make very good sense to you because, however unfortunate it is, we expect that um, health status, uh, health outcomes, health access, health coverage will vary by some of the factors that we've just talked about, especially income, education, and uh, uh, income and education. But I, I want to say, before we look at this, though, that it's very, very important when we think about health disparities to go beyond looking at the link between disparities and in income. Um, a fair number of people are concerned about health disparities or who examine this uh, in the global health field tend to focus on disparities by, by income. These are very, very important. But I think what we've just seen is that if one were to stop there, one would miss a lot. And it's really important to look at a range of factors associated with disparities, some of which go substantially beyond income, even though others might be quite closely tied, tied to income. So let's look first, having said that, at some of the relationships between health differences, uh, and health disparities, uh, and uh, income. Now, before you ask, let me explain that um, the, the people who work on health and global health some years ago created a variety of indices which allow them to divide populations up by what they call income quintile. And, and this is poorest 20%, next 20%. Quintile means it's divided into five. And so we're dividing the population into groups of 20% from the lowest 20% to the 20% 20 20 of highest by, uh, by income. There's actually more to this than, uh, than really just income but that's the subject for other discussions. So I'm really just gonna use the word income for now. So let's look at how this plays out uh, in two regions. And here we're looking at birth attendance, attendance at birth by skilled personnel. And here what we see is in these two, I think these were UNICEF subregions of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, what's the difference between uh, attendance by skilled personnel at delivery by income quintile? Sadly, in some respects, but as we might expect, what we see is a very strong correlation between income and coverage, with coverage going up in a very linear way as income goes from the poorest 20% to the richest 20% of the population. And clearly, if Emily were the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Health and talked to Rachel as the president of the country, she would say, Madam President, sadly, we continue to see in our own country important disparities by income group. But I want to assure you that under my leadership as the Minister of Health, we will do all that we can to compress these by helping to enable our poorest people to achieve the same nearly universal, hopefully universal, coverage of birth by skilled birth attendants as our better off people already do. Let's look at another one. And here what we see just for the poorest 20% and the richest 20%, for the same two regions, the percentage of underweight children zero to five in, in these two regions over this period. Uh, and here what we see is the blue is the richest 20%, the orange is the poorest 20%. And of course, what we would expect is, as incomes rise, we would expect children to be better nourished and we would expect to find lower rates of children being underweight. And in fact, that's what we find. What we see here is, again, a very strong correlation with the poorest 20% of the population in South Asia having rates of underweight among their th zero to five-year-old children, which are almost three times higher than in the better off communities. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're more than two times higher. Let's look at another graphic on disparities, also by income. And this is coverage of measles. And here what we see again is we might uh, expect, however unfortunate, is a very strong correlation between income and coverage. Now I'm happy to tell you that thanks to important efforts by a number of countries, as well as important collective efforts through, for example, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, the Gavi Alliance, Vaccines and Immunization,
if we were to take, look at this for 2013 and superimpose it on this, there'd be a very good story to tell. Immunization coverage rates have gone up, and they've gone up even among these groups. There's still, there are still important gaps, but many countries and globally have, we've made important progress in closing these gaps exactly as we would want to see happen. Now, we can also look at location as a factor uh, linked to disparities. And here what we're going to do is look at the percentage of stunted children, 0 to 5, by location for selected regions uh, as well. And stunting has to do with children who are too short for their age. Okay? Uh, actually, they're much too short for their age, shall I say. And here what we see is we would generally predict that urban children, even though they're urban slums and there are a lot of poor people in urban places uh, everywhere, we would still expect that, especially in low and middle income regions like these, that um, urban children will be better nourished than rural children. And indeed, what we find is substantial differences between the two. And in one case, in fact, probably in some respects reflecting indigenous populations as well in Latin America, we see that um, children living in rural areas have rates of stunting that are more than twice as high as those living in uh, urban locations. And we're going to see this as well for contraceptive prevalence. And this again is another look at urban and, uh, and rural. Here we have percentage of women 15 to 49 who are using contraception by location. And here, we, of course, we would again predict that in rural areas they would have lower, uh, lower use. Access might be less. Uh, coverage might be less. Knowledge of the families about contraception might be lower as well. Uh, but again, your goal as policymakers would be to try to ensure that all families, whether they're urban or rural, have the same knowledge, understanding, uh, and information needed to make enlightened choices voluntarily about the extent to which they wish to use contraception. And the world, uh, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, still has a substantial distance to go before these disparities can truly be considered to have been uh, reduced. Now, there are also important differences ethnically as we've discussed, and this graphic looks at uh, maternal mortality ratios in two countries over a certain period of time for indigenous people. And it compares the rate, ratio, maternal mortality ratio for indigenous people with the maternal mortality ratio for the country as a whole. We would predict that indigenous peoples, for the reasons that we know well, would actually have higher ratios of maternal mortality than the average population, or non-indigenous people. And indeed, in both of these countries, Bolivia and Honduras, that's exactly what we see. And one of our goals, we hope, will be uh, to see that, whether it's Bolivia, Honduras, or the country in which we live, that such disparities along ethnic lines uh, are, are reduced. Now, um, I, I want to say also that uh, in addition to thinking about income, location, ethnicity, religion, occupation, etc., we need to think also about financial fairness, which is not something that everybody does, and it's not a factor that uh, everyone un understands very well. But, um, we also want to take a look at the way in which the health system is financed and try to be sure that that itself is fair. There are countries in which we see that the better off people, let's say the best off 20% of the population, actually gets 30 or 40 or 50% of all the health benefits from public expenditure on health. And by contrast, in some of those countries, which you also see, as the bottom 20%, who in principle you might want to help more, actually receive less than 20% of the benefits from public expenditure on health. This is a complicated matter, uh, but I want to uh, remind you how important it is to think about financial fairness as well and look at the way in which the system is being financed and in a way ask yourself the question, who pays and who benefits and what's the extent to which benefits flow uh, compared to your share of the population. And uh, if you're concerned, if you have a special concern for poor and marginalized people, 
in principle, you might want to see a disproportionate share of benefits flow their way. What you don't want to see is a disproportionate share of benefits flow to the upper income groups. As I noted earlier, uh, health disparities is a central issue in public health and in global health. And it's very important that in all countries, uh, policymakers and people seek to reduce health disparities to the um, minimum. Thus, as we work on global health and study global health, as I mentioned earlier in this session, it's really important, I think, to keep on an equity lens and to use this equity lens to look at all that you're doing. I would encourage you to keep equity, inequality, and disparity in mind at all times. I also would encourage you to be careful about how you use numbers and be careful about using averages because it's really important to be sure that we don't miss variations either within countries or across countries, within groups or across groups. We also want to look at how every piece of data we're dealing with in global health relates to health access, health coverage, health status, as well as think about how it is the system is being financed and whether or not that itself is fair. Hopefully you have a better sense than you did when we began the session of uh, the importance of uh, health equity, uh, of the factors that relate to health disparities, and the importance of ensuring that as you think about health, public health, and global health, you always keep on an equity lens. In the next session, we're going to talk about the environment and health.